We good? <laughs> we good. We All good. Right. Let's do this. Hello guys, welcome back to the fifth episode of the Wave Running Podcast. Today, we're here with a man that needs very little introduction, Ed Goddard, 28-23 in the 10,000 meters at Box Hill, I think, 62-16 at Longchester. Was that the one you did with Tom DeCanto? Yeah, that was the one. Yeah. <laughs> and the marathon in 213.45 at Manchester, if I'm not mistaken. I think you have done a faster one at um California. Yeah, wasn't legal. It's not legal. Yeah. Yeah. It's all downhill, <laughs> isn't it? That one. Uh I mean, yeah, net downhill for sure. Net downhill. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Cool. So yeah, welcome to the podcast. And uh um, Thank you for I, having me. <laughs> one thing I respect about you is you know, you spend a lot of effort and time engaging with the community and you know your followers and all that because I think it's pretty hard to get in touch with pro athletes a lot of times and I really appreciate it but yeah we'll good, just talk about <laughs> your running recently and what's coming up and that sort of thing we just have a casual chat but to For start sure. off you recently did the Sydney 10 and you won it in 29 23 if I'm not mistaken um talk us through the race it was it was a good race um it was annoying because they changed the course up a little bit from from the last few years because like I think until this year it's been like the quickest 10k in in Sydney um but they just made the course I think a little bit tougher and a little bit uh longer um which was a bit annoying but but overall it was a it was a good race and it was fun but but yeah sort of just like first first race of the season just went out went out the front and just sort of threshold work workout kind of vibes because just on my own but I had a lot of fun and good way to start the season yeah fair enough um <laughs> and i guess real quick i did see that you're racing the hawker runaway half this sunday yeah. but what made you want to do that last minute yeah very very last minute i um i mean i i kind of really like the event i haven't done it for for six years now and so i was like usually i'm overseas or like i was at college in america or COVID. um but but like I didn't have any excuses this year. And so I was like, perfect opportunity to get back, back out there. Um, I mean, it's a, it's a tough course. Like it's not somewhere you go and run a PB, but it's a good experience. Like, and like anyone, like, you know, from living in Sydney, like how nice the city is and getting to run on the roads and, um, and like the running community here. So, so a perfect opportunity to, to do that. And I'll, I was going to do like a, I've been doing a long threshold every week anyway. So like 20, 20 K is hard. Um, and so it's perfect. Yeah. But yeah. <laughs> um, so obviously you kind of treated the Sydney 10 as a threshold you kind of run and you're going to treat that poker runaway half as also a threshold you run. When is yeah. going to be your first like all out race kind of thing? So you got Launceston in two weeks. Um, and so that's going to be the first sort of all out, all out one of, of the year. Um, I mean, Sydney 10, like, I would have been happy to have a big crack and try to run as fast as I can. Um, but it, it was just one of those days, like, I was hoping I'd have company for a bit longer or or even even have lead bikes sort of closer to to me, but they were a couple of hundred metres away and couldn't really see it in the whole race. Um, so it was just lo- lonely at the front and just from, from early on just sort of realised that it was, wasn't going gonna, wasn't gonna to be that day. I think we need a Dan Breen next time to cycle. I think so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think so. I mean, we did a good job at that at the, at the half last year. Um, just because, I mean, any of those long events, like a lot of rhythm comes into it and just having sort of that stimulus sort of nearby is, is a nice feeling, a little bit of company and stuff. And yeah, are you planning on doing any marathons this year at all or not really? Yeah. So first one's going to be Gold Coast Marathon um and yeah with like all the points system for the olympics and world champs and world road running and stuff like perfect opportunity to get some points race a good half and not have to travel um and hopefully like beat a few other guys and and sort of get my name a little bit higher up the higher up the ladder yeah obviously you are aiming to get to the paris olympics in 2024 so yeah it'll be good to get a few good marathons in and i do know that Joe Fukuda, the Japanese guy that I managed to run with a little bit at a race here in Japan. You're going to be racing him at Gold Coast, which would be pretty cool. Perfect, but yeah. I mean, you... he's such a nice guy. Oh, you met him, okay. And how do you think you fare against him? I, I have no clue who would be faster. I mean, it would be interesting because, I mean, he's he's won the whole race before. 
Like uh, he's won it once. I think he was second or third another time. Um, and I mean, he's run. I think has he run two nine two ten. So he's run. He's run pretty quick. But I think. I think I've been training pretty well. Like I've got no excuses with, with the work I've been putting in um, or like my overall health or anything. And so I think like, yeah, I've got no, no excuse or no reason not to run to the best of my ability. So that's, it's a nice feeling going in and still got sort of seven weeks to go. So just got to iron out anything else that comes along on the way. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm pretty keen for it. I think you're one of those guys that are known for doing an insane amount of mileage every week. <laughs> I think, yeah, you typically do about 190, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, yeah, yeah about, and, about that. And that's about like 27 k a day on average, which is pretty insane. But <laughs> um, big. I know you talked about this in other podcasts as well, but just for the listeners who don't know much, like, Maybe give a brief rundown on what a week in training looks like for you. Yeah, so I mean, I'll simplify it as well. I mean, so <laughs> so the start start the week on Sunday is just sort of thirty k's, um, and it averages about four minute k's. Usually, like first half probably averaged about four fifteens, four tens, and then last half sort of averages about sort of three forty fives, fifties, um, and so get get picked up a little bit, um, but sort of don't go into that race sort of seeking a workout or seeking anything in particular from it more than just a, just a good long, long time on the legs. Um, Monday, usually 70 to 80 minutes in the morning and uh, 35, 40 minutes in the evening. Uh, Tuesday, I'll do a track workout or I'll do my Thursday workout and sometimes I switch the two, but usually track workout. Um, and so something like 10 by K esque or I usually break it up a bit more like uh, maybe I'll do some 2Ks or some 1Ks and then 400s or 600s kind of thing. But but similar to the workout we filmed uh, last year, like all that sort of energy system is very, very similar. Um, and I guess the only thing I'm a bit more focused on this year is getting a bit more faster stuff in, sort of um, 200s or 400s, um, which I wasn't doing as much last year. And I also start every track session with two or four by 200 as well just to get the legs going a little bit which is which is nice and i've enjoyed that um and then evening i'll double uh like 30 to 40 minutes as well which is which is, is that nice. an easy double or yeah very all the doubles are pretty pretty chill um unless unless i do a double workout day which i did do this week i did like a 30 minute threshold in the morning and i did uh, five by K and some two hundreds in the evening. <laughs> and when do pretty, you do double day. threshold days? Do you kind of do it when you feel good or not as much when I feel good, but I sort of write them in like this week. I know, like I like doing three workouts a week and I know going into a race that I wasn't going to get the chance to do that, that Thursday workout. Um, and so it was a good way to get some sort of threshold and some faster running but without combining them both into one session. So it sort of gives okay. a little bit more recovery time to the legs um, and just allows you to run a little bit quicker, a little bit, a little bit fresher. Um, but I, I enjoy it as well, but um, I'm not, not certain on the science or, or like the, if it benefits the body in any different way other than just sort of fitness and endurance and speed endurance. But, but yeah, I've been, I've been enjoying it. And I think I probably do one every sort of three weeks. On a Tuesday. Yeah, Wednesday is the same as um, Monday. And so just like 70 to 80 in the morning, 30 to 40 in the evening. Um, and I'll usually chuck Jim in there as well. And so it's, I mean, it's not a huge running day and it's usually backing up from that workout. But um, getting the gym in as well is, I mean, it's, it's necessary, but it's uh, sort of pretty hard work. And like, it's obviously harder work than just an easy jogging morning. Um, but so it's sort of, it's sort of an awkward day, but I always find it hard to get gym in. And so it's, it's sort of the best of a bad, bad situation trying to get that in. Um, and then, yeah, th Thursday, then I'll go into uh, sort of, a, it's, it's um, my long threshold day. And so, I mean, the bulk of the workout is sort of 20 to 23 K is hard, but then I'll jog before and after. Um, and so it sort of turns out to be like a, 33k run and so it's pretty it's a pretty bulky morning session especially like when i get that 
uh, 60 plus minutes out of like 257s or 259s, like usually on the treadmill or half outside, half treadmill or sometimes all outside. Um, but yeah, it's a pretty, it's a pretty tough workout. <laughs> Do you break it up at all or is it kind of sustained threshold for like 20, 23 games? Just sustain, sustained threshold. Okay. I mean, it's, it's not the same as, but I guess when you look at like African runners, um, like a lot of them do that long threshold on a Sunday, which might sort of translate to like three twenties for, for two hours or something, um, or something, something like that, or, or like 30, 32 Ks at three twenty. Um, and in a way it's the same kind of workout because, if you take the like four minute 20 Ks when I'm jogging and then you add them to the, the hour at um, sub threes and then the warm down, it, it turns out to be basically the same kind of uh, long run effort. And so that is also sort of my midweek long run as well as uh, that workout. Um, and I mean, I, it's my favorite workout of the week. It's also both the easiest and the hardest workout of the week because I think it's the hardest physically but mentally it's the easiest to get up for just because it's like, well, I'm getting on, if I'm on the treadmill, I'm just getting on the treadmill and all I got to do is just run. Um, but also like it's, it's a pretty hard hour as well. So it's sort of contradicts itself a little bit, but it's, it's fun and I enjoy it. Gotcha. And Friday. Yeah. Well, and then so double that night and that turns into like okay. a 37 to 40 K day. So that's pretty big. Uh, Friday's pretty chill. I usually go gym and, so the 17K, Saturday, I'll do like a threshold and hills workout, maybe like 2K, 4 by a hill, 2K, 4 by a hill, 2K, 4 by a hill, 2K or something like that. And then I'll double in the evening and then get gets back to Sunday, and 30K and do it all again for three months. <laughs> pretty crazy. I actually agree with you in the sense that it's pretty hard to work out a day to fit your gym in because yeah. like... When you do a fair amount of mileage, it's kind of hard to compromise feeling shit in the runs yeah. by being sore from gymming, right? So it is For a sure. hard compromise, but you kind of do have to do it to prevent injury and whatnot. So, yeah. You, you do. And I mean, it's funny because like a lot of people do do gym on their hard workout days just to sort of bulk them two together, which which I guess is actually pretty similar to a double workout day when you're getting those two sort of hard stimulus. Um, but I think... I, I mean, it's, it's nice not having to do gym the day before a hard workout, but, but often like Wednesday and Friday, that's obviously the case. But I used it on a Monday and I switched it away from Monday just because I found doing a gym day between long run and a Tuesday track session was, was pretty hard. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And yeah, when you talk about your like weekly routine, I think the average person would think you know that's absolutely insane like mind-boggling yeah. they're never going to do that sort of thing but i guess have you ever gone through and i know the answer to this but just for the listeners have you gone through injuries from doing a lot of training or not really i mean so yes but i've only ever had one one injury and that was when i broke my heel in half running um but that was sort of i mean i don't think i'm going to make the same mistake again but I definitely did uh, fly too close to the sun, if, if you will, because, I mean, that's the one thing with running. It's you got to know when to push and when to pull, and you got to know sort of when when your body's had enough. Um, and I think getting the – breaking my foot off the back of that big COVID year when, when sort of race – like you trained all year without much break, without much sort of periodization because of lockdown and stuff. And then I got into races. Then I had another mini training block and then got into more races. And then I was going back into another training block to try and sort of qualify for that Olympic team. I just, I didn't have enough uh, downtime and I sort of let like uh, some of my bloods and, and stuff like that and fatigue sort of internally get on, get on top of me. But yeah. yeah, I mean, that's the main thing is, is running. I think you just got to make it sustainable, both like enjoyment wise and, and for your body. 100%. And what's your like periodization like since? Because it's obviously been a good few years for you now. You haven't been injured, been maintaining sure. pretty good mileage. Yeah, I mean, last year was last year was tough because uh, like with with COVID, when I had COVID and I had um, just a few sort of complications from that. And then and then I sort of bulked a few sort of big races together at the start of the year. Um, and I should have I should have sort of listened to my body and and sort of backed off for a little bit but I sort of kept on racing through until 
um, until December, which was, I mean, it was decent. It was a decent year, but I didn't, I didn't sort of achieve as much as, as, as I wanted to. Um, and so the big takeaway is I had pretty chill December, sort of restarted that whole fitness, sort of build everything again from, from scratch, which was a really nice feeling. Um, and so it's been sort of like six months since I've had a big, big race. Um, and but I've had like four months of uh, running 180 to 200k weeks, and so yeah. <laughs> I, know, I know I've got that base again, which I haven't built since I did break my foot, and so it's nice to be able to sort of start over. Um, because I mean, as any sort of runner knows, like consistency is is the first step to running running as fast as you can. Yeah, for sure, and. Yeah, going more into like half marathon and marathon racing now, you, I looked at your world athletics profile and in terms of points, they're quite close, your marathon and half marathon PB. So what would you say is like your stronger event right now? I think I've nailed the half marathon better than I've nailed the marathon. I think the marathon has been, been sort of a pretty, pretty interesting experience. I mean, it's a pretty tough, tough event and a lot can go wrong pretty quickly it takes you sort of a few races to sort of realize sort of those signs in your body or and stuff like that i mean so my my first marathon in melbourne i felt great until 40ks and then my body just sort of sh- shut down but i mean that that race was annoying because like they didn't put my nutrition out on the table and so i basically had to run that on on just water <laughs> really okay i didn't know that yeah and so that was i mean that was in summer as well so it was, it was pretty hot in december and so that, that was annoying. And I mean, but every, every race you sort of learn from it, both like about your body and even just what to do. I mean, so my, my last marathon, like I carried two gels on me just because I knew like you can't always rely on, on tables just because like running sort of 20K an hour and trying to pick up a bottle off the table. Like even if you practice it like a million times, like most, like you can still make mistakes. And so I think in marathon preparations, like both, getting the work in and also like getting like your body accustomed to what you both have to do physically and mentally and sort of ex- extra stuff as well. Um, and so I think my half is sort of a more complete race at the moment, but I think the marathon wants to do put those things into our practice. I think that'll be, that'll be the one. Yeah, I agree. I think the half marathon is a bit nicer just because it's over in like an hour and a bit, right? So exactly, you could get away with not taking gel. Do you take gels for half marathons or no? Uh, no, I just sort of pre pre feel. But um, I mean, I might actually this weekend just to just to test it. I might take one with me. Um, but during yeah, or before? I mean, probably during, just to um, yeah, just to get a bit of prep. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, the second half is pretty hilly as well, so I mean, it can't it can't hurt. What I noticed when I recently did a fifty k run or fifty watt. 51, 52k run is that, yeah, yeah nutrition is pretty hard to nail. And this exactly. was my first long run. I feel like I didn't know what I was doing and it took me so long to just consume one gel. I just had a gel packet in my hand for about 4Ks trying to gulp it down. Yeah. And I just didn't take enough. And yeah, I ended up bonking luckily after the marathon because I wasn't going as quick. Um, But I feel like I want to nail the nutrition a bit more. And I'm also curious what exactly do you take like what gel do you take in the marathons i mean it's probably more often than not it's just the morton ones um but i mean i like the goo roctane ones as, as much as the morton like i think they're sort of as good as each other or maybe even the, the goo is maybe even a little bit better than the really? morton okay. one um yeah. i mean it's not as high caffeine but it's just got a lot of other stuff in it but i think the main thing is like it's not as important as sort of which one you're using or like which fuel you're using. It's just getting the right sort of quantity in at the right time is the main thing. I like the texture of the Morton a little better personally, just because it's more like jelly and goes down a bit easier for me. I feel like goo is quite thick typically, unless you get the liquid energy goose. But yeah, yeah, everyone has their own preference. Some people like having the gels with water as well. So yeah, that's, yeah to that's each me, their I kind own. Of- yeah, I kind of put it in my mouth and then just get get water to wash it down. <laughs> yeah. And going back to the Melbourne marathon that you're talking about, your debut marathon, was that also the one that you ran with Tom DeCanto and Brett Robinson for most of it? Yeah, that was the one as well. Yeah, that that was a good few races where you three were just at the front kind of yeah, not jogging together. Obviously, you were sending it, but 
<laughs> well, it looked like a joke to a lot of people because you guys look pretty yeah. comfortable. But yeah, you guys were flying, and that was pretty sick yeah. to see. I mean, that's the thing. Like, I think that's one thing with the marathon because it is such a rhythm race. You can you can really like find that that sweet spot where where you just can get really locked in, um, and that's sort of when the when the magic happens and when it sort of starts to feel like a bit of an out of body experience, and then you can just sort of yeah lock in and and just run as fast as you can down the roads that's the nicest feeling <laughs> yeah honestly after doing my recent kind of 50k run at a decent pace i feel like i enjoy that a lot more now it's just like locking into a relatively comfortable pace whereas like a 5k on the track seems like it hurts a lot now and i'm dreading it because i do have a 5k on the track coming up and it just seems really quick now compared to those marathon efforts and yeah what made you kind of push past the 5k and 10k you know at a pretty young age because you are a very young marathoner i mean the thing is like i don't i don't see as i mean obviously like i'm not going to be peaking to run a 5k um if i'm racing a marathon but also at the same time like i think i could run a pretty good 10k pretty good half off um off marathon training and i think I think one thing that's going to benefit me and I have been doing is um, training in that sort of more 10K session once a week and getting that marathon session another time a week and sort of just trying to sort of balance it between the two, get that fitness in, but also get that speed stuff. Um, and I think that's going to be most beneficial for me because I think at the end of the day, like as fast as you can run in in 10K, well, like it can't it can't hurt with feeling easier at marathon pace yeah for sure and another interesting thing yeah again on the world athletics page i saw that your 5k pr is extremely outdated obviously it's like <laughs> 14 40 something i think my 5K, or is it 14 30 my uh my road 5k is 14 40 um but on on the track of run uh 14 flat and i've actually split sub 14 in in a 10k as well on the track exactly that's what i was gonna say yeah so i mean it's yeah it's pretty funny (laughs) obviously you have some good marathon times and 10k times to prove it but what do you think is possible with your current fitness in a 5k i mean i mean in a 5k it'd be interesting but i think i mean the main the main sort of dipstick would be the fact like uh for the last few years like I've, i've sort of struggled to run under sort of 2 240 for fast reps in training um but in the last few months, like I've been able to go to go under 240, like a few times a workout or even without, without putting that much effort in. Um, and so I think that's my sort of anaerobic threshold increasing. Um, and so, I mean, when I ran 28.20, I think if I was doing a fast rapid training, I'd probably run like a two, 243. Um, whereas now I can sort of run like uh, sort of mid mid two thirty, um, and so I mean being able to run sort of eight eight seconds faster for a, for a hard K, I think, uh, I mean it it would mean that sort of, um, I mean we split that race in the thirteen fifty eight, uh, and so if I could do that off sort of that fitness, I think now like I'd I'd be able to predict like I could run sort of significantly quicker than that, but also like yeah you gotta you gotta do it's the main the main thing. Uh, yeah, for sure. So, <laughs> Hopefully this season I'll get a get a proper crack at it, which would be nice. Yeah, I'd love to see you race the best of Australia and see how you stack up against them because it would be cool to see a marathon step down and like it would still be. kill it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that was honestly like one of the hardest things about uh, this year. I mean, because I sort of made made the mistakes of sort of over racing last year. Like I had to sort of step back and not not race some events which I really wanted to do, like nationals um, or or like some of the sort of New South Wales 5K stuff or any of the Grand Prix stuff in uh, in Australia. Like I had to sort of step away from all that and just train. But that's where I'm looking at that being like the most beneficial thing for my for my running. And now we've talked a lot about like your current, you know, racing and training and all that. But I think the viewers and listeners would love to know your upbringing and how you got into sport and all that. So I guess, can you run us through you know, what age you started, how you kind of progressed towards where you're at now? Yeah. I mean, I sort of started sort of in like year, year six, um, but like I played a lot of different sports growing up. Um, but to me, sort of running was that that sport where like the more effort you put in, like the more benefits 
uh, and results you'd get sort of coming out of it. But like, I mean, I wasn't, wasn't like the most amazing junior. Like I made nationals for the first time in U11. I mean, I came second in nationals in U12, which was, which was good. And I sort of uh, improved pretty quick. Sort was of that cross around, country or? Around then uh, on the, on the track in the 5k. But I mean, I think it's just one of those things, like I'm a big believer. I mean, for everyone that like, if you want to be good at running, like you, you can find an event like which, which suits you and you can be good at. And if you can put their work in, like you're going to, you're going to have a successful sort of career. And that's sort of always been my sort of like philosophy. And I think I've always been one who's been sort of more happy to put the work in than, than not. And sometimes it's been like a learning curve of when you're going to pull back. But yeah, I guess sort of growing, growing up just running at school and States and then started to make like, New South Wales teams and then Australian teams and stuff. It's sort of always been uh, just progressing sort of one one up. And I've always sort of seen that as sort of keep making steps forward. Um, and that's sort of the best way to do it, I think. <laughs> and where does the NCAA kind of college era come into picture? Like when was that? I mean, it would have been nice to spend a bit more time there. I mean, yeah. obviously with COVID, like that sort of cut it all pretty short, but sort of 2019. Um, and so I came, had World Junior Games in 2019. That was probably my biggest, biggest event. And I came fourth there, which was cool. And then headed off to college in America. And then a few months into the season after, like gets cancelled after indoor season and then missed nationals and because of outdoors and COVID and, sort of rolled on for a little bit of time. Um, but then I went back once all that was over and reached nationals over there again. And so, I mean, I was there for sort of two, two and a half years, but I didn't get to spend as much time sort of on the ground as I would have liked. Yeah. And now Max Mahon is taking over. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, it's a, it's a good college. I honest. I mean, it'd be interesting to see how, how he goes, but I think, but I think, yeah, the North, the Northeast is definitely the, the region to go to in, in the NCAA. Yeah. Okay. And have you been keeping in touch with Max Mahon? Because I think I've only seen his Instagram and I see the occasional kind of updates. I think he's run like a low 14, 5K and stuff, but how is he going in general? I mean, he's going, he's going pretty well, but I think the one sort of perception is like a lot of people think like they'll go to college and, and like they'll just run fast from being at college, um, which I mean, like is, is true for like a lot of the time because the races are uh, are very good quality but um but at the same time like living away from home and and so in a, in a new country and in stuff like it is it is pretty tough and i'd say like america's a bit behind on sort of injury treatment and and all that kind of stuff or even even at college like you can always get sort of access to a to a, like a physio but they're they're not as um sort of willing to like do acupuncture or work on you as as they are here or you got to share that physio with sort of 40 other people um and so i mean i think that's a sort of quite quite tough part about being in america sort of dealing with with all that yeah obviously the experience is really different for each kind of runner that goes to the ncaa in the u.s but sure. some of the colleges are like you know they recruit a lot of runners and then they just put them all in this super high mileage high intensity program yeah. see who comes out the other end and becomes good and then kind of don't look after the guys that get injured which is pretty sad to see but i mean a lot of the other times like if you're there for sort of five years like a lot of people have sort of one or two good years and then have sort of spend the other sort of two or three years sort of injured or, or broken down and so i mean it's funny because i think i think there will be a bit of a change coming through where like you see a lot more guys come from the ncaa like pat tian and ollie Hoare and and stuff like that but i mean you see the amount of guys go over there and then even still, like a lot of the guys making Australian teams sort of never went to college. And that sort of goes to show that like, even though you sort of run quick times in fast races over there, sort of once you start to make senior teams, like you've got to make it work for yourself, which is sort of the hardest part. Yeah. I think as I've, as the years have gone by, I've met more and more kind of Australian runners in Sydney that talk about how nice it is to live in Australia and have, sure. having grown up here and become a fast runner here. So they kind of want to stick to what works and want sure. to stay here, which is pretty cool. And I think more runners should do that because Australia is a lovely place to train and get fast. And there's a lot of good clubs and good community as well. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I agree. I think, I think once it starts to happen, like a lot more people will do it. Like 
I mean, Jess Hull, I think, is going to base herself in Wollongong instead of base herself with Union in America. Um, and so, I mean, maybe a lot more girls will sort of flock to to where she's at or you see sort of the on group in Melbourne. Like, I, I mean, I don't think they're – I mean, it's not necessarily the, the strongest – team in Australia but the fact it's sort of pretty pretty well supported and I'm sure like a lot more people start to go to to go there I mean I think once these sort of teams and networks get set up in Australia then a lot of people will feel like they can be comfortable with living in in training in Australia but I mean yeah I mean to me it's like a no-brainer living in Sydney like it's the best place to train and the best climate to run in as well yeah definitely and i think physios in australia are actually very good people just take physiotherapy very seriously in australia even the courses as well like they really teach you they force you into these placements where you get a lot of professional experience and all that so i think the quality of treatment is a lot better here and i know you go to 4d health but can you talk a bit about like what they're doing stuff for your recovery and all that for sure. I mean, I mean, so for, at 4D, like in the, in the city, I mean, it's great because like every time, every time I get a little bit sore or a little bit beaten up or, or anything, like I can always just go in and get, get treatment like immediately, which is nice. At the same time, like uh, I do my gym in there. They've got like treadmills, Ultra G, but it's, it's sort of that regular access to physio, which I think is the most beneficial thing. Like it is that sort of college sort of idea where like, if anything just comes up, you, you don't sort of wait a week or two or to see if it goes away and then sort of seek out treatment. I'm sort of very much of like the mindset, like you're going to spend more days running and, and running pain-free. If you if something comes up, you just get it treated immediately. How often do you do those like dry needling stuff? Because I do it sometimes as well. And yeah, it's a pretty interesting feeling. <laughs> it is good. I mean, it's pretty, it's pretty painful, but I think if I need it, I'll do it every week. Um, but it might be like, glute one week and it might be calf the next week but so sometimes it's sometimes like I won't get it for a few weeks and sometimes I'll get it sort of maybe twice a week but but usually it's getting sort of massage every week um, and then dry needling is whenever I get sore um, yep, but it's sure. funny like I've I've been like sort of really tight calves on on a Friday um, and then gone in like Friday evening before my Saturday workout just because I know like how much better off I'll be getting it treated then while, rather than waiting after the weekend. Yeah, definitely. And now moving on to more like fun and random topics. Um, yeah. Obviously, you love the Cubs baseball. Talk us sure. about how you got into baseball and supporting the Cubs. <laughs> I mean, I love, yeah, I love the Cubs and I love all sports. I mean, my parents used to live in Chicago. And I mean, anyone who follows baseball knows that they play uh, 164 regular season games and plus the postseason. So it can be like 185 games a year. And so you're watching it basically every day. And so it becomes like a lifestyle as much as it becomes your sport team. And I mean, I'm, I'm lucky the Cubs won a few years ago and we had a few good seasons, but it's been it's been the tough the last few tough the last few years and hopefully they can start to turn things around because I mean it's one of those sports because they do play so much <laughs> it's pretty depressing if your team starts losing every day. I remember a while ago when I when we made like a reel for your Instagram and we were doing that collab posting and I just felt like I couldn't not add the hashtag go cubs in it because like every other post has it so i was like i kind of have to even though yeah, i don't know what's sure. going on <laughs> yeah, yeah it's pretty no, funny it's, it's funny i mean yeah it is, it is crazy because like i mean american <laughs> american sport fans as well are pretty are pretty wild um but yeah it's good to be good to sort of support a team that like the cubs that um yeah, it's just a, it's a good network but i mean i follow like chelsea in the football i follow like Brisbane Broncos, Brisbane Lions, like I follow, um, I mean, I follow like every sport really. <laughs> Have you seen like baseball culture in Japan? I think you've seen the Yakult Swallows game once, right? Yes. Or something? I've seen, yeah. I've seen, <laughs> I saw them play the Giants at Tokyo Dome, but I mean, in <laughs> Japan is, is crazy. I mean, sports culture in Japan is awesome. I mean, I'd love to, I'd love to go back to Japan. I was meant to go um, this year, earlier this year and race, um, but that sort of got put in the same basket as, um, as nationals that I, I just had to sort of train through and get the work done before I got back racing. Japan's like an awesome place for, for everything. And so I'm hopeful I get back soon, but, but yeah. yeah, I mean, it's, it's so different to, to Sydney as well. It's almost like the polar, <laughs> polar opposite. It's a whole new world. Yeah. Um, but yeah, try and come when I'm here. It'll be pretty fun to 
get content here, run around the streets. Because obviously, for sure, I know you love, you know, just bending it down traffic lights as well. <laughs> yeah, uh, which is always funny well, to see. But yeah, yeah. When are you thinking of staying there until? To be honest, I still don't know yet. I can go back to Australia as early as July, or maybe September, or if not, then it might be like next July. So it could be a combination of things, but. Hopefully sooner rather than later. But at the same time, if I'm staying here till, you know, December, I will have a lot of friends coming here for the holiday. Uh, for for sure. their summer holiday or winter, obviously. But yeah, it'd be cool if you can come as well during that time. It would be. But it would be cool. I mean, I think I think I do want I do want to race over there for sure. And I mean, there's some good road racing will sort of start back up again in in probably sort of October, I'd say. Um, and I mean, I will race a marathon at the end of the year. So I mean, maybe I'll look to Japan it would be pretty cool. Yeah. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, that's, it's funny, like second half of the year, I haven't, haven't put any really thought into rather than just sort of get through July marathon, marathon prep and, and see how, see how we're placed after all that. Yeah. I respect how, you know, you're aiming for super big goals, like making the 2024 Olympic team, but you're still like quite flexible with your training and your seasonal arc and all that. And you kind of just go with the flow and you're enjoying it. I mean, I think that's the thing with, with running, like you do have to have some sort of dates locked in, but like running's never a linear thing. Like if it, if it was like, it'd be so easy and, and ev everyone would be successful, but I mean, it's just adapting to different things or at the same time, like with races, like, sometimes like sometimes races are super fast and sometimes like the next year maybe no one's no one's doing them i mean like i was looking at doing a race in south africa like last year it was one in sort of 27 10 this year it was one in 28 30 and it was like super super windy and so i mean it's it's one of those things like sometimes you take gambles and you take risks and uh on, on trying to find different races and sometimes you just got to adapt to uh what's happening <laughs> around you yeah. Another thing I want to touch on, and I think we're going to start jumping through a lot of different topics because I think there's a, quite a bit more I want to get there. But for sure. Singapore, I found out that when I went there for about a week, a lot of people know you and follow your journey and everything. But I know you've been there a couple of times as well. But what are your thoughts on Singapore? I, mean, I love I love Singapore. Like every time I go to like Europe or, or that part of the world, like I always I always stop there and have have a day or two just to um just to chill rather than flying straight straight through which is i mean it's nice to break the legs but i mean it, it's similar to japan in in some ways but it's i mean it's a pretty yeah pretty different pretty different country which is which is cool but i mean it's nice to sort of immerse yourself in like different running culture especially when you're only there for like a short a short period of time and i mean a city like singapore that's so small i mean you can see most of the city all in in one run which is which is nice but but I think that's one of the sort of adventures of, of running. Like it's the best way to travel. It's the best way to see places, like it's the best way to meet people. And so when I'm, when I'm traveling, I'm always like always getting out and, and amongst it. Like I'm never the type to sort of go and jog laps of like just one park. Like I sort of always want to sort of explore and even my runs in around Sydney, like I, I never go to Centennial Park and just do laps. Like, I'd much rather run through the city or, or find some new cool loop somewhere. Yeah, I agree. I think even when I went to Singapore, I tried to commute via running and stuff, just so I can see sure. the city more and get to know the roads and whatnot better. And yeah, great way to see yeah. the city. It yeah. is. It's just so hot in Singapore. <laughs> that's the only, that's oh, the only yeah. problem. Yeah, I, I think all my runs were significantly slower when I was there. But <laughs> yeah. it's also funny because like, Singapore is such a small country. It's still kind of developing its athletics culture and whatnot. So like For sure. when someone like you comes to Singapore or goes to Singapore, sorry. Um, yeah, they think you're absolutely alien. And <laughs> like, they just think you're the best runner in the world, which is pretty funny. Um, it is funny. I'd love to do Singapore Marathon sometime as well. That's always been, that's always been something I've sort of looked at and like, oh, that would be, be kind of fun to race a, to race a full marathon in that kind of heat and humidity. Yeah, for sure. And they, they'll love you. So I, I think they definitely want to see you race there. Because like I said, I don't think I met a single person in Singapore that didn't know you, which is pretty yeah. insane to know. Like you're pretty global is, now, now that, you, now cool. that you're with Ashley and everything. But speaking of, I think when we were driving once, we were talking about how running is a sport where it's not as you know big as football and 
rugby and all that sort of stuff. So there's not as much media coverage and whatnot. So the average person can't even name the top five best marathoners in the world, right? So you talked about how it's so important to build a following on socials and have a bit of personality and whatnot. Can you talk a bit more about the importance of that? For sure. I mean, I think my point was like, um, I mean, with football, like you see these guys on TV every week and, and their, their teams are the ones putting out a lot of content about them. Um, and there's commentators sort of talking about them like every time they play. But in running, like, I mean, you look at, you look at these races, I mean, especially with all the major marathons, like because marathon is such a hard event, like you can only run a few a year. So, I mean, if you're a casual spectator and you watch Boston and you watch Tokyo Marathon, like they're going to be two completely different fields of people. And so... I think as, as runners, like it's, it's important to sort of do that, get that sort of like content out yourself, not even, not even for um, sort of selfish or, or, or like intrinsic purposes. But I think that's what the sport, the sport needs is just good, transparent content from, from people and from brands. And I think ASICs have been doing a, a better job at that. And I think a lot of other brands are sort of doing similar things. I mean, on and, and all that stuff, but I think it does have a long, long way to go. And I think um, it'll be interesting to see where running does go. Cause I mean, for people who do watch running, like you look at a team like NN and they're probably the easiest to follow team in the world. Like of all the, of all the African runners I could name, like, I mean, most of them are with NN and the only reason I sort of know their names is because they get posted about or, or they're wearing like a unique kit or sort of similar things like that. Um, and, and so I think that's that's important but I mean that's kind of as well like getting back to this weekend like running the half like like I do love the sort of running culture in in Sydney and it is a good way to sort of sort of net, uh, socialize and, and stuff with a lot of a lot of people which is which is cool and I mean you go to a football game and there's sort of thousands of people I mean you go to a big running event and there's also thousands of people I mean they're spectators but they're also competitors like they're all you're racing everyone and you're participating with everyone which i think is sort of a unique angle running has over different sports but it is it is funny how um how like there are a lot of people who actually love running um and i think it's it's something that if people can tap into it more i think the sort of following and market for running is is huge over the years it has gotten like better gradually i feel like we've never taken a step back in a year so it is going sure. in the right direction. So it'll be good to see it carry on. And people like you help out with that just because you're putting out content, you're making running more fun to watch because the more people understand what an athlete has gone through and what their personality is like, they're going to root for you more. So we want to make sure that, you know, not the best two runners in the world are the only people that are known. And we want to make sure that everyone's a lot more known so that People just exactly. follow professional sport and be interested in it. So, yeah. But speaking of ASICs, when did your journey start with them? Uh, so, it started in 2021, sort of mid midway through the year. I mean, it's been it's been super cool to be part of a brand like that. But I think ASICs in particular, like, are putting so much effort into the stuff they're doing, both sort of on the track and off the track. Um, and, and so, it's been awesome to sort of be, be part of that. And, I mean, got to race in Spain with them last year and I've got to sort of do a bit of travel and, and stuff in London and as well with them and so I mean it's been it's been pretty awesome yeah I think in terms of their shoes as well like it's the if I had to pick one brand to get sponsored by it would probably be asking just because of their great range of shoes like you got your Nimbus as your daily trainer but you you also have your Nova Blast which is a little bit faster also have those Super Blast which are amazing for long tempos in my opinion and yeah the racing shoes the Metaspeed Edge and Sky Plus are both super solid but can you talk a bit about what your favorite shoes are from the Asics range? Yeah, I mean, I, I do agree with that. I mean, even before I was sponsored by Asics, like I think especially for joggers, like Asics shoes are uh, like number one. Like I don't know why people jog in Nike Pegasus or, or stuff like that when these um, sort of alternatives exist. But I mean, so I jog in the, in the Nimbus for my easiest jogs. I jog in the Nova Blast for sort of mid, mid-range jogs. Uh, jogging the super blast my long run and and a few other um a few other runs a week but then when i get into the faster stuff like i've got a pair of prototype which are like they're almost like an lt street kind of thing so they're like a plateless um lightweight racer 
Um, and so I do a bit in them and then in the meta speed range as well, like for all my speed stuff and all my racing. Um, and I mean, my favorite thing with that is I think the shoes that are going to come, come out next year for the Olympics from ASICS, in the meta speed range, you're going to be pretty, pretty unbeatable, which I'm, I'm super keen to see. Yeah, I'm super keen as well. But I'm sure a lot of listeners are curious. Do you race in the Meta Speed Edge Plus or the Sky Plus? Uh, I mean, probably the Edge more. Um, I mean, the Edge Plus more. But I have, I mean, now, so I'm lucky enough to be able to race in prototypes. And so I've been testing the new Sky and the new Edge. Uh, this weekend, I'm going to be testing the new uh, Sky for the half um, and Launces, and we'll see. And for Gold Coast as well, like now, now the shoes have been approved um, for the IWF stuff. Like I can actually race in them, which is going to be pretty sick for the marathon. Yeah, definitely. Cool. Well, I think we'll slowly start to wrap it up, but I think we covered a huge range of topics in this <laughs> episode, which is nice. I know for the sure, second sure. half got a bit jumpy from topic to topic, but I wanted to cover everything, you know? Exactly. But, That's the way. That's the way yeah. you got to do it. To finish up the podcast, um, 2024, you make the Olympics. Be yeah. pretty sick. <laughs> it will be sick. I mean, but who do you yeah. think will be in your team with you? Uh, I think, I mean, obviously, like Brett would would have to be in the team. Um, but I think, I mean, the next spot, I mean, obviously, Andy's running well, Pat Tierna's running well, and Liam Adams is running well. And I'm probably maybe I'm even forgetting someone else. But I mean, there's sort of like five or six guys sort of at the top of their at the top of their game in Australia in the marathon at the moment. So I think Brett's going to be one of those guys and I think there'll be sort of two more spots up for grabs. But I mean, all I can do is is put hard work in training and, and race well. I feel like that's going to that's gonna happen this year. I think la- last year sort of I tried to sort of push on through and, and, and race a lot without getting that big training block uh, reset. But I think the fact they've gone back and done all the, all the little things, I guess, in training and, and all the rebuilding stuff, I think this year is going to be uh well well planned out <laughs> yeah 100 percent. and sorry there is one well there's a few listener questions but it'll be super quick um That's okay. you can answer them as short as possible yeah. one of them is how do you decide whether to record your strava activity on your phone or your watch or manually upload uh so i mean for races i've been is races usually are the only time i've been using my uh watch um just because i mean i mean vibing room with the phone and because i haven't been racing as much as well like i haven't been used to using my watch like i i don't even know where it is in the house like somewhere <laughs> but i mean and then manual uploads like if i do a little bit of my run on a treadmill i'll yeah i'll just manual upload the whole thing or if i do a whole thing on a treadmill obviously i'll manual upload the whole thing but as well like on my phone like i mean the strava apps a super accurate b my phone's got music and my like wallet so i mean it's all you need when you run as well. So, I mean, that's, that's my number one running utility. That is true. And then the last question was, if you didn't take up running, what sport would you have done? Mm, I mean, probably cricket, I'd say. I'd cool. say. Um, but, I mean, I'd, I'd love to try baseball as well. But I think, I think my skills might be there, but my, my size and power might be, might be lacking against some pretty big dudes. <laughs> Like uh, Shohei Otani, best exactly. baseball in the world right now. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Well, on that note, we'll end the episode here. Thank you so much for taking the time to come on. I'm sure we'll do another episode down the line, but good luck yes. in the Hoka Runaway Half and your journey to the 24 Olympic Games. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, no, it's going to be fun. It's going to be interesting, that's for sure.